talk about our prayer book. This is a book of names. These people have given us their names and they need prayer. This is not a prayer request book. There is no specific prayers in here, but God knows what each and every one of us needs. The book is always down here on the barrel. If you're here in person, you can put your name in it. It is full of names and families who have put their names in there. If you're on the internet, you can send it in to the address that's going to be provided. And if it's not there, you can go to our uh, website and uh, get the address off of that. Mail it in. If you send in a good address, Pastor Woody will send you a decal that says Rockin' Country Church is praying for me. And this is just a reminder to let you know that a small church in Kemp, Texas is praying over you. And we pray over this book multiple times a week. We are almost every day of the week here at the church. And then most of us pray at home over the book too. So gentlemen, if you'll remove your hats one more time and we will go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, we just thank you so much for this. We thank you for these people, Lord. We ask that you'll just touch them and lift them up, whatever they may be needing, just fulfill whatever needs they may have. We thank you again for allowing us to come together, Lord, and uh, to worship you and to hear your word. We pray that you'll lay your hands upon Woody, that you will fill him with your spirit and allow him to deliver the message that you have given him. We pray that you'll be with our community, Lord. Lift each and every one of the persons around here up. We pray you'll be with the other churches, Lord. We ask that they'll preach the Bible, and if they don't know the Bible, Lord, that you will show them the Bible. It's very important that when people hear the, your word, that it is indeed your word. We ask that you'll lay your hands upon our offerings and our tithes, Lord, and allow it to be used in a way that you uh, have delegated it to be used, Lord. And we just, we just thank you so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, good morning, Rockin' Country Church. So glad to be back. I had a great, great time, as y'all, many of you noticed, in Mexico. And... Uh, no, I didn't gain any weight. I think I lost a couple of pounds. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> hey, that's a good child. Like, like Chris said earlier, that's my favorite kind of food is Mexican food. And I, I've eaten it about five times already this week, and it's okay. I don't get tired of it. It's a good child. But uh, anyway, I had a great time down there, learned a lot, accomplished what I went down there to, to do, which was to uh, learn about uh, our partners down there and in real estate, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So thank you for that opportunity to allow me to go down there and expand my knowledge. It was uh, really, really fun and really good. And I got to sit on the beach. Who, 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 could, who could not love that, right? Who doesn't have their knowledge expanded on the beach? Exactly, exactly. I do want to uh, uh, remind everybody, that, or not remind, but uh, just proclaim, I guess, that I did watch the services. And uh, they were awesome. Uh, Chris, you did a great, great teaching. And I thank you for that. Uh, I did watch the services, although, just like I explained to uh, someone yesterday, to Brother John and, and Carla, being at home does not, does not hold any water, speaking of water, hold, a, hold any water to being here in person. It doesn't. It doesn't. Uh, it doesn't, man. I enjoyed the, the services online. Uh, I see that we're still having some glitches on things, and that just really, 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 we're trying our best to get that all worked out. So those of you who are watching around the world, and I know there are some out there who are watching from other countries. Gloria over in Australia watches diligently every week. So uh, I know that... Uh, there's glitches on it, and we're spending some money, and we'll go over all this in the uh, in our business meeting today to get that all corrected and to do as best we can. Uh, a lot of things happening, a lot of things coming up, a lot of uh, things that are, uh, I have in mind for this church, and uh, it's going to be a, a very, very good meeting. So you, if you can join us uh, after services today, that would be great. Sorry, just needed a... A shot of water. Um, one thing I do want to let you know or fill you in on is that uh, as a church, uh, we have the Christmas for Kids that, are, that is coming up on December the 2nd and 3rd, which is a Friday and a Saturday. It's a Friday night and then a Saturday. Uh, we'll be going to the um, Kemp Junior High School to hand out uh, gifts and to uh, have an, an event, if you will, to where we are supplying Christmas, if you will, for kids and families that are in need this year. Again, they're selected by the teachers. Uh, we have nothing to do with that, and uh, we need volunteers. If you want to be a volunteer, 
I have to have your name today, today, because I'm going to turn that in. Uh, Rachel needs it by Monday, tomorrow, so I have to turn that in today. So please, 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 if you're going to help us either Friday night or Saturday, the 2nd or 3rd of December, to do the Christmas for kids, then I need your name. So, because you cannot get in without your name being on the roster. So please give that to me today. Do not forget, because I will, all right? Almost guaranteed. Uh, now, as far as what our church is going to do for the Christmas for Kids, we're going to buy the bicycles again. Uh, we need, uh, just to let you know, I need a check for about $1,200 for the bicycles. It'll be for about 11 or 12, maybe 13 bicycles. But we figured that that will cover them because bicycles are, uh, they're anywhere from about $80 to $120. And so we need uh, about 12, a check for $1,200 so that I can get to Rachel so that uh, she can purchase all the bicycles. Uh, if the Lord leads you to give towards that, please indicate on your check or on your envelope that you're giving it for Christmas for kids. If not, that's fine. Just uh, whatever ministry you so choose. But remember, you know, we go all year long and we don't, we don't do a whole lot for our community, though we try to. We do some things on the 4th. We do some other things, uh, uh, you know, during the year. But this is the time to give. This is the time to become the church and show the community that we are a giving church. We're a loving church. And we're here, as Paul tells us, he says, we are to provide for the wid widows and orphans. And we are to. We are to. Those are, in other words, those are people who are, who are in need. And so we're here to do exactly that. So if the Lord leads you to give towards these, uh, any of these ministries, the Angel Tree, the Christmas for Kids, any of the other things that we're going to do this year, please do so. Uh, God will bless you. God will bless you. Now, I know over Malachi uh, uh, 3, 5 through 8, I believe it's 5 through 8 or 5 through 10, he tells us that test me in these things. Test me in your giving. And we, we usually look at that as our tithes and our offerings, right? No, no. What he's talking about there is tithes and offerings, giving to the church so that the church can function. Well, the church doesn't just function on keeping your electricity on. The church functions, functions by being the church, by supporting the community that it's, that it's in. That's the church. The church is not just somebody, uh, just a building here that somebody can come to and listen to a word and feel good and go home. That's not the church. The church is out there. We have to go out there. We have to be the church out there. You're all saved. You're good to go, right? If we all got wiped out today, we'd go to heaven. I hope. I hope. All right? But... But there's people out there who would not. And so we have to go out there and be that Christ for them. That's what Jesus calls us to do, Matthew uh, 28, 18 through 20. Go out into the world. Not, not in here. It's out there. That's where we need to be the church. Here we are the church. There we need to be the church, all right? So if you can su support us in any of these uh, ministries that we're doing this year, uh, we've got another one that I'm going to introduce you to next week. It's our church that we support in Mexico, down in Mexico. Uh, and uh, we're going to bring that to you next week and give you a lot more information on it and let you know where it's at and what's going on, et cetera, et cetera. So this is being the church, friend. This is being the church. Not in here, out there. And so if the Lord leads you, only if the Lord leads you, remember he says give with a cheerful heart, right? Give with the right attitude. If you don't have it, don't, don't give it. Do not use a credit card. Never use a credit card. That's not your money. You're borrowing that money, and you're in debt. And Scripture says don't go in debt. But if the Lord leads you to give and you have the means, please do so, okay? Please do so. We want to be the church for this community. All right. Uh, I don't see, but Bobby is, uh, okay, well, Bobby and number 11. But are, is that the only kids we've got today? All right, so is he going to stay in here or is he going back? What are you going to do? He's going to stay in here. Okay, very good. Then what we will do, we'll go ahead and pray up our teaching, and then we will get started today. Our uh, scripture, uh, I think it was up there, is Ephesians 1, starting in Ephesians 1. Certainly we're going to look at other scriptures, but that's where we're going to, that's our main scripture for today. So go ahead and open your Bibles there. We'll get started in just a little bit. Yes, ma'am. He says he wants to stay in here. So, 
No, he says he wants to go. Okay. So I guess he's going, Dan. And thank you for assisting him. So we will pray up their children's church, our child church. Is that what we call it? Our child church. And, uh, and, and let me tell you, at our business meeting today, we're going to talk about some things that I am looking forward to building our children in this church. Uh, it is so vitally important. Uh, as you all know, uh, Brother George passed away last Monday. We had his services Friday here at the church. We had 144 some odd people here, or somewhere around that, a lot of people here. And uh, we have to understand that it is appointed to each of us to die at one time. And a lot of us are getting a little older and up in the years. And a church will close if it is not replaced. Okay, we need children, we need younger people, et cetera, et cetera. So these outreaches that we do are for that. It is to try to build God's church, whether it be in this building or whether it be another building, it is to build God's church, which is what Jesus calls us to do, all right? Uh, it's being obedient. So with that, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Pray up our child church, and we will dismiss, and then we'll get on with our teaching. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. We give thanks Praise, honor, and glory to you, Lord, for all things. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be here today to worship you. That's the reason we're here, Lord. We're here to worship you. Worship you with our hearts. Worship you with our mind, our soul, our spirit, our attentiveness to your word, which is Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Lord, open up our minds, hearts, and souls, and spirits to receive your word today so it may resonate and it may grow and manifest itself in our very spirit, in our very soul, so that we may go out in the body as, as the body of Christ, as the church, and be what you have called us to be. Be with Miss Deanne today. Let her use, use her as a tool in order to instill in our child that is going back there the very word of God. Use myself, Lord, as your tool, as your vessel, to do the exact same thing, to try to instill the Word of God into the hearts of those who hear today. Father, we love you. We give you thanks for all things. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's dismiss. Have a good class, tater tot. That's what I call him, a tater tot. Sometimes he likes it, sometimes he doesn't. All right, we're going to uh, be, I, I know I told you before I left that it would be in John 3, verse 7, right? Uh, we are still going to touch on that. We are still going to touch on John 3 and 7 next week. Uh, as I came back this week and thought about all the things that are going on and started thinking about John 3, et cetera, et cetera. The Lord says, hey, you know what? Thanksgiving's Thursday. You know, what are you thankful for? And of course, my first thought is, well, I'm thankful for food. Thanksgiving dinner, right? I love Thanksgiving dinner. Then I got to thinking a little bit more deeper, right? And I started thinking, Lord, I'm thankful for you. I'm thankful for you and what you've done in my life. I'm thankful for you and what you will do in my life. First and foremost, ahead of everything else, I am thankful for you, Lord, that you would save a wretch like me, as Paul puts it to us. I don't know why he did it other than the fact that he simply loves me. And that's exactly why he did it. And that's exactly why he saved you. You, I mean, you're special to me, but you're nothing special. Except that God loves you as an individual. He loves you. He has your name written in his heart. He knows every hair on your head. He knows every freckle on your nose. He knows every step you have ever taken, every tear you have ever cried. He is caught in his right hand. God knows you and he loves you. He loves you so much that, as we know in John 3, 16, that whosoever shall believe it in him, God sent his one and only begotten son. That's how much he loves you. Would you send your son, your daughter, to, to die for someone? Not a chance. Not a chance. But God did. Because he loves you. 
because he loves you. So what are you thankful for this Thanksgiving? Today we meet and every Wednesday and Sunday and every other time, as Chris says, we're here about seven days a week, eight days a week, I think. And uh, we meet for one purpose, really and truly. We come to do the things that we do, the things he's called us to do, the ministries he has called us to, to work, if you will. But we come for one reason and one reason alone, and that is to worship God. Our ministry, our works, they are to worship him, to glorify him for what he has done, already done for us. Our worship is and should be divided into segments. We have praise, we have prayers, we have teachings, etc., etc. We have our works, the things that we do. But it all comes together as one thing, which is to worship God. That's what it's all about. We don't do the things that we do so that God will love us anymore because Scripture tells us He cannot love us any more than He already does. We do the things we do because we love Him. We worship Him through our efforts, through our works. And we need to continue doing so. More so and more so and more so each and every day. It's our thankfulness to show God. It's our attitude of gratitude. It's our appreciation for what he's already done for us. And what he is doing for us. Because he's working in each and every one of our lives every day, is he not? Sure he is. And also for the promises that await us. All of his promises. All of his promises that he has given to Jesus are ours to behold. Every one of them. And he has glorified his son by seating him at, the right, at his right hand in heavenly places. We have a spot in heaven with God. That's how much he loves you. This Thursday is the day of our thanksgiving. Many of us will give thanks for the food, for our jobs, for our houses, our, our things, our families, those that love us, those who love us from afar. We'll give thanks for many, many, many things. But generally, as an overall view, if you will, of the world, we don't give God thanks for God. We don't. Oh, yeah, I mean, I'm going to have my, we celebrate our Thanksgiving Saturday. All my kids come down. We've already got a house full expected. And I'm going to be so thankful to see my grandkids, see my kids. Well, maybe not my kids, but my grandkids. No, my kids as well. I'm going to be thankful for the time we're going to spend together. We're probably going to ride motorcycles, shoot guns, pop fireworks, whatever we do. And we'll have a good time. And we do that, and, and we have a tendency to put God on a shelf for a while. Whereas we need to realize none of that is possible. None of that is possible without God. We would not even be here without God. But yet we kind of put him to the side. Many times we come to God. We, 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 want, we want this. We need this. Well, God, what about this? What about that? As in the Lord's Prayer, what we call the Lord's Prayer, which is over in the book of Matthew and the, Matthew, and the book of Luke, in the Lord's Prayer, it doesn't start off with, oh, God, I need this. Oh, God, I need that. God, I want this. God, I want that. Ooh, look at that cool truck. God, I sure would like to have that brand new truck. As long as it's a Ford. <laughs> we don't start that way. The, what we call the, the Lord's Prayer is, is that our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We start that prayer with praise. We start that prayer with thanksgiving. We start that prayer with honor and glory as to who we're talking to. But most of the time, we come to God and it's, oh God, here I am again. 
I know I messed up. Will you forgive me? Well, sure he will. But why don't you just come to him and say, God, thank you for being who you are. Thank you for giving me life. Thank you for giving me all the things that you have given me. Thank you for loving me. But no, we just want more stuff, generally speaking. Now, as Christians, and I hope especially ones who have been in this church for a while, that we understand we don't get anything or have anything without God being involved. The, uh, in the um, gospel, I mean the uh, first book of John, in John 1, it says that everything was made by him and for him. So everything that you have is really his. He's just letting you borrow it and use it as you, as you want. Sometimes we don't use it the proper way, do we? Such as our lives. Sometimes we don't use our lives the way God intended us to use it. Anybody been there? Yeah. So why don't we start giving him thanks for our lives and start living for God instead of living for ourselves? See, we're here to live for God. We're created for his good pleasure. For his good pleasure, not our pleasure. He wasn't created for our pleasure. We were created for his So why don't we live that life? It's because we're stuck in a rotten world that we're in. And we're going to look at some of those things today. We're going to look at some of the, the things that we ought to be thankful for. Paul really gets into it over in the book of Ephesians. He tells us some things that, look, you need to understand where you came from and where you're going. So we're going to go there in just a little bit. Only God gives life in all that is in it. God's word is love letters written to mankind, that all that will, will believe. And to all, their love letters written to all who will believe. And it is a, a, a warning. God's Bible, God's word, God's love letters are a warning to those who do not believe. So God even loves those who refuse to believe. He even gives them fair warning over and over and over. In the book of James, it says, draw near to me and I shall draw near to you. Well, the opposite of that is if you draw away from God, God is drawn away from you. It's not because he wants to. It's because you refuse. But if you draw near to God, he guarantees you he will draw near to you. We should all be thankful that the Father loves us so much that he would send a book of love. A book of love? Well, over in the Old Testament, it's all about killing and, and, and uh, wiping out people and all this, that, and the other. God loves us that are his. His enemies he destroys. Let that sink. His enemies he destroys. His enemies, he destroys. You are either in love with God and loved by God because you love him, or at some point in time, you will be destroyed. Now, what does it mean, destroyed? Does it mean you're just going to, God's just going to come up to you one day, oh, well, you don't believe in me, so bap, and you're gone, you're, 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 no. No, you're given Time after time after time, opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. God introduced, over in Romans 1, it says, God has made himself known to all of mankind, to all of creation, so that creation is without an excuse. God does everything he can to try to get your attention. He'll even use a wife that says, if you don't go to church with me, you are some deep shimshy bubba. Okay, so you better listen to your wife, all right? Or your husband, possibly. Or maybe your preacher. How's that? Because the, you, there, it is a book of warning. It is a book of love, and it is a book of warning. So we need to realize just how important God is to us. And sometimes, I'm sorry to say, most of the time, we really just take it for granted. Oh, well, God's there. He'll forgive me. 
Well, again, over in Romans 1 in 20, 24, 28, and 20, uh, 24, 26, and 28 verses, he says that he turned them over. That means God took his hand off of those people. Takes his hand off of those people. When God takes his hand off of you, you are destined for failure. Destined for failure. All these writers of the Bible, because of their experience with this love that God has for us, took the time and the direction to share their experiences with the world, with the world. In each book, hidden among the pages, you will find two things that the writers always teach. One is theology, and the other is doxology. Theology and doxology is throughout every book in the Bible. Theology and doxology. All right, so what is theology? Theology is the teachings that develop our belief or develop our faith. It is the training. It's the teachings that are throughout the Bible. The Bible is not just a book of words. It is a book of instructions, Bible, B-I-B-L-E, basic instructions before leaving earth, okay? It is a book of instruction. It is a book of theology, allowing us to know the true nature of God. It is to show us the true nature of God, just how much God really, really, really loves us. Then as we progress, we come to know him more and more and more and more. As we progress through the theology of the Bible. And the more that we know him, the more we will come to love him. The second thing that is in every book is doxology. Doxology is our public worship of praise or thanks. It's what doxology is. It is our public it's not, oh, well, I don't want anybody to see me, so, you know, let's, let's pray real quiet. Okay, uh, most of y'all don't know Big John and Carla. I call him Big John. His name is John. But Big John and Carla, they're, they're, they used to go to our church years ago, and they went to another church because they had grandkids to take care of, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not going to tell their story. But the thing is, is that yesterday when we were at our men's breakfast, uh, John was looking at me and I was looking at John. I knew who he was, but I couldn't think of who he was. You ever done that? And I thought, who is that? That's Big John. And that's what I call him. And I've always called him that. And he's a big man, okay? So anyway, went up to him. Long story short, uh, right there in the middle of McLean's, uh, we prayed. I have no problem with it whatsoever. None whatsoever. Uh, yesterday afternoon, I was... Uh, where was I at? What? what? Uh, yeah, I have. Uh, some, some, I, I'll just put it this way. I don't have a problem praying to any time, anywhere, under any circumstances, okay? I, I don't care what people think. They can look at me. They can laugh. They can do whatever they want to do. It doesn't bother me one bit, okay? I don't pray to them. I don't pray for them. I pray to God, and I pray for God and whoever I'm talking with, okay? I'm not ashamed. As Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it compels me. It is the, the, the power that brings people to salvation. So, no, it doesn't bother me to pray whatsoever at any time. And so, anyway, right there in the middle of McLean's where everybody's eating their eggs and bacon, uh, John and I are having church. There you did. <laughs> yeah, he yeah, did. Yeah, he did. He rested his fork. <laughs> but... Uh, we have to realize, we have to realize that we, we have to give God public praise. If you, now, you do have a time that you need to speak, spend with God. Scripture tells us this. John, uh, Jesus tells us this over in the book of Matthew in the um, Sermon on the Mount. He says, take your prayer into your prayer closet and talk with God where it's just one-on-one. You need that time. You need that time one-on-one -on -one with God, all right? Because you're not going to hear God generally if you're in a big crowd of people. But if you're by yourself, you can hear the voice of God talking to you. But for the benefit of those who may see and may need prayer, you need to pray publicly 
Never, ever, ever be ashamed of your relationship with God. Never be ashamed of it. Glorify God with your praise and your prayers. And that's what doxology is. It is publicly sharing with others what God has done in your life. And as we become more and more and more enveloped in his word and his character, we come to an understanding of the enormity and the vastness of his love for us. And so we give him praise. So we glorify him. We honor him. We love him back. Today, as we plan for our Thanksgiving feast Thursday, let us remember why we're truly thankful Today, we'll partake in the elements, what we call the Lord's Supper. Giving thanks for what Christ has done. Giving thanks for what God has done. Our scripture today is Ephesians 1. Much of the time, we'll go to God with all of our problems and desires and wants. And after our petition, we give him a short thanks. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. After all we've done is whine, 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 whine. Oh, well, my wife did this. Oh, my husband did that. Oh, my kids are doing this. Oh, Lord, I hate my job. And on and on and on and on. That's backwards. And our church has allowed, not our church, the church, has allowed us to misunderstand how we are to approach the throne of God. It's not with, oh, it's, it tells us, humble yourselves. It doesn't mean walk to God like, oh, I know I'm a shameful sinner, God. Oh, please, 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 don't, don't strike me dead. That's not how you humbly approach the throne of God. You humbly approach the throne of God by knowing and recognizing and honoring and glorifying and praising the one who is seated on the throne. Lord, I don't know why you saved me, but I'm so glad you did. You're the most awesome thing that has ever come into my life. And he is. And I thank you, Lord, for letting me be a part of your history, your life your love. Approach God in reverence, but approaching with thanksgiveness. Approaching with thanksgiveness. He's allowed you to live one more day. Ephesians 1. Paul, this is probably one of the one of the best compositions of theology and doxology that your salvation and my salvation is based on. Verse 1, chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. By God's will, not by his will. God had called him to be an apostle. He had called him into service. And Paul answered that call to be appointed by God as an apostle to us, to the Gentiles. So this letter, though it is written to the church of Ephesus, it is, it is written to the Gentiles and the Jews to know who God is and where and why we are who we are. To the saints who are in Ephesus and the faithful in Christ Jesus. That's the rest of us. The faithful who are of Christ Jesus. That's us. Grace and peace to you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now here's the doxology. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, 
that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Wow, God is going to make me holy and blameless. How could I not praise God for that? I am not holy. I am not blameless except for what God has done. Having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasures of his will. As he had called Paul to be an apostle by his will, he has also called us to be adopted into the kingdom. That is his will for us to be a part of his life. How fascinating would that, is that? How thankful I am to let, that God would actually look at me and say, yes, I want you to be in my, in my kingdom. I want you to be a part of my life. God wants me. Me. And you. He wants you. That is his will, to have you as a part of his life. We don't have a dead God. We have a live God who is living and he wants you to be a part of his life. Why would we not give him praise for that? Why would we not thank him for that? Having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise and the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved in Christ accepted in in the beloved that beloved is Christ Jesus only through Christ Jesus are you accepted into God's kingdom man do I want a new truck or do I want to thank God for him I want to thank God for him do you see God through Jesus Christ is giving you the life that only God deserves. He's giving you the life that only he deserves. Wow. It, it blows me away to think that God wants to spend, listen now, God wants to spend eternity with me? My wife took off and went to Oregon for a month. <laughs> she did it to be with her dad. You know, she's, oh, believe me, she'll, she'll be back. I guarantee you. She'll be back to be with y'all. <laughs> but think about that. God, it gives you the opportunity because of his love for you, not because you're special, though you are special to him, because he died for you. He gives you the opportunity to have his life. He's the only one that deserves it. He's the only one that, that should have it. But yet he gives it to you. And he gives it to you free. Free. You don't have to pay for it. You don't have to do anything for it. Except believe in Jesus. How simple can that be? Evidently it's pretty darn hard for some people. Simply because they don't want to believe. They don't want to believe. That's the doxology. That's the praise of God for what he has done. He has made eternity available to everyone who shall believe. Everyone who shall believe. Number seven. This is starting the theology. The theology is teaching us why we praise God in the doxology that we just did. This is what he's done for you. In him, we have redemption through his blood. Everyone agrees with that, I hope. There's no other way to be redeemed except through the blood of Jesus. I hope everybody agrees with that. Is that right? Can I get an amen? amen. All right, all right. For the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, his grace, that's his love, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence. All wisdom and prudence. All wisdom and prudence. Now, that tells us right there, there's some things we need to learn, right? You don't get wisdom just by, oh, well, I'm just a smart feller. No, you get wisdom, which is knowledge, 
and how to use knowledge, you get that through learning the theology of our Lord. Because he teaches us. It is a teaching. This is a teaching book. Basic instructions before leaving earth. We must learn the theology, the teachings of God. Having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, not ours, his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself. Himself, that's not God the Father, that's himself, God the Son. He purposed it in his Son. His Son is the one that came to the earth. God incarnate came to the earth. Emmanuel, God with us, he came to the earth to walk and talk and show those 12 guys exactly. The one song that we did here, it says he is the example, and he is the example that we are to follow. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on the earth. In other words, there comes a time in him, there comes a time when God is going to gather everything together and it is going to belong to him and him alone. There will be no more evil in the world. There will be no more Satan among us. If you read over in the book of uh, Revelation, back in the back, around uh, chapter 19 and 20, you will see that Satan, the false prophet, the Antichrist, all those who do not believe will all be cast into the eternal lake of fire forever and ever and ever and ever. So there will be no, it is the new Jerusalem that God is going to bring to this earth, to this earth according to his word. And we will live forever in his eternal glory. Verse 12. That we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. That we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. It's not for your glory. Oh, well, I'm a Christian. Everybody likes me because I'm a Christian. I wear the name tag. I wear the cross. I go to church. I do this. I do that. Oh, man, I'm such a good person. There's no way in the world God would ever want to do without me. It's not for your glory, friend. It's for God's glory. And he did it, not you. Because Scripture clearly tells us over in the book of John that no one comes to the Father unless they are called. No one comes to the Father unless they're called. That's in John 6. In him you also trusted after you had heard the word of truth. After you learned the word of truth. Learned the word through the word, right? Right? You have to, it's the reason we do Bible study. We don't, everything about this church is Bible study. It's not about doing anything else but, but teaching you this Bible. The gospel of your salvation in whom also having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise who is a guarantee, a guarantee from God. Of your inheritance until the redemption of the proposed of the purchased possession. You're the purchased possession. God paid the price so that you would receive and could receive your salvation. Until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory again. It's nothing you did. God didn't save you because you're such a fantastic person, though you are. God called you unto himself because he loves you, not because you love him. Therefore, I also, after I heard, okay, now this, this goes from the, um, from the theology back to a praise, kind of a doxology, but not a doxology to God, which is what a doxology is. This is a praise to to what the people have learned from the theology that we just talked about, all right? Therefore, I also, after I heard your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease in giving thanks for you. This is Paul praying for the church of Ephesus and, and all those who will believe, making mention of you in my prayers, 
that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Wisdom and revelation. There it is again. God's going to reveal to you more and more and more instructions about him as you progress in your faith. How many of you have read a scripture and said, oh, well, this scripture means this? Few years, few weeks, whatever down the road, you see that scripture again, and now that scripture means something totally different in your life, and it is more powerful in your life. It is more structural for your life. It is more instructional for your life. It is more of a sound doctrine in your life. It's a more sound theology in your life. It means so much more because you have something right now that you needed an answer for, and bam, there it is. That's what he does. He gives you what you need when you need it. But you got to be faithful. You got to be faithful. See, there are some things that you have to do, not for your salvation now, but there's some things that you have to do in order to grow in your faith. You can't just come to church and say, oh, yeah, I go to church every Sunday. That's where I get my nap. I don't think we have too many people slip in here. But, but sometimes people come to church, and I've seen it many, many times. Sorry to say, guys, but this is mostly guys. Guys will sit back there like this. Is he ever going to finish? You can just see it rolling around in his mind, you know. God, what am I going to do for lunch today? See, I wonder if she's going to fix lunch or if i got to go buy it. How much money I got in my checking account? Maybe we can use her checking account. We'll put it on the credit card and go in debt. That's what we'll do. I mean, it, it, people are not in tuned. They're not in tuned. We can displace ourselves from God in church. Why would you? Do you realize what you're going to miss out on? You're going to miss out on knowing God. Knowing God. Not knowing of God. See, this is what the church taught, teaches. The church teaches, oh, well, I want, you need to know of God. You need to get your life straight. You need to do this. You need to do that just so that you'll know God. You're never going to be good enough. You're never going to be perfect. Only God is perfect. Jesus said over in uh, John 3, uh, not John 3, uh, it's whenever he's talking to the rich young ruler. He, the rich young ruler to him and says, good teacher. And Jesus says, whoa, 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 whoa. Who are you calling good? There's nobody good but God. We just studied over in Romans 3. There is no one righteous. No, not one. None of us are. We all fall short of the glory of God. But as we learn, as we learn through the theology of God, through our doctrine that we study, we come to know God more and more and more. But we don't just know God. We know of his love that he has for each of us. His sacrifice that he has put up with us for all these years without us say, even saying thanks one time. How many years did I go with, with just saying, I don't need God? Man, I, couldn't, I, couldn't, I could not bear to think that I would actually say that statement. Now, why? Because I know God. I know Jesus Christ. And I know that he knows me. And yet he still loves me. Figure that one out. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. You see, God is going to shed light on himself more and more and more on a continuous basis. That you may know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of his glory, of his inheritance in the saints? No eye has seen, no ear has heard of the most awesome things that God has in store for you. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the works of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places? That is available for me and you. 
God is going to raise us from the dead. Brother George passed away last Monday. God is going to raise him from the dead at some point in time that only God knows. And we will see George in the physical again. We will see him in the physical again. And I'm sure he'll be cracking a joke. And he'll be saying, you pray for me because I need the prayers and you need the practice. Far above all, principalities and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only of this age, but also in which in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head of all things that to the church. He is a head of all things, which is the church, which is the body, his body, the fullness of him who dwells in all in all. The fullness of God that dwells in you. Don't think that you have a half God or you have a part God. You have all three dwelling inside of you if you are a belie true believer, true believer in Christ. You have to be a true believer. Oh, well, yeah, I got dunked one time, so I guess I'm saved. That's not a true believer. Oh, well, I go to church all the time, but I've never really been into that, you know, saving thing. You're not saved. Well, you know, I, I believe some of the Bible, but not all the Bible. You're not saved. Now, I'm not trying to judge you. That's not my point. My point is, is that the Bible is Jesus Christ. John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word, John 1 and 14, made his flesh among us, made his dwelling among us. Jesus is the Word. So you have to believe the Word and take it as a whole. You can't just dissect what you don't like and take it and throw it away. You're not God. What? I'm not, I'm not the God of my life. Well, you think you are, but you're really not. You may be the ruler of your life, but you're not the God of your life. Verse two, or chapter two, verse one. And you, he made alive who were dead in your transgressions and sins. Wow, what a graveyard. You realize that if you do not have Christ, you are not made alive and you are dead in your transgressions and sins. The wages of sin is death. The book of Romans tells us that, does it not? So you're dead in your transgressions and sins. You live in a graveyard. Ooh, that's kind of, I hope that gets your ears tended there, you know. I live in a graveyard? Yes, because you are dead. You are dead. Again, I'm not the judge, but you're actually dead to God. Because you're not alive in Christ. If you're not alive in Christ, you're dead to God. In which you once walked according to the courses of this world. There's three things here that keep us away from God. The course of the world, which means the world's ways that we have to live in. We have to live in this world, whether we like it or not. According to the prince of the power of the air, Satan is roaming around over in 1 Peter 3 or 2 Peter 3. Uh, Satan is roaming around like a roaring lion looking for somebody to destroy. Don't think, Satan is the tempter. He is the liar, the father of lies. He will tempt you. He will do anything and everything he can to destroy you. To destroy you, not just to hurt you. To kill, still and destroy, the word says. And the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, that is Satan's influence, the demon's influence, which tempt us to fall away from the guidance and the direction of God that we know. Anybody know they shouldn't sin, but they do it anyway? <sighs> I hate to be the first to confess. I'm glad y'all spoke first. <laughs> all of us, that's right, every one of us. We're all disobedience. We have all broken, most likely, I know I have, the Ten Commandments which is God's holy commandments. I know I've broken all 10 of them. I don't want to share that right now. I've shared it before, but I'd be happy to share it with you. The biggest one and the worst one, I guess, is thou shalt not have any other God before me, which is his first commandment. I have put things before God many a time. 
And over in James 4, uh, 2, 10, it tells us if you've broken the least of these, you've broken them all. Broken them all. I have certainly lied in my, in my ears. So therefore, I'm the center of sinners. Paul says, what a wretched man I am. But our God is a gracious, forgiving, loving God. Thank goodness. Among whom, verse 3, among whom all of us uh, also, we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. Uh, remember over in uh, 1 John uh, 2, 16, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, the three things that causes all sin. And we're by nature children of wrath, just as the others. If you're not a child of God, you are a nature, or you are a, um, a, an enemy of God, Romans 5.10 tells us. And if you're an enemy of God, an enemy of God, then God's wrath will be poured out on you. I love this next one. But God. See that? But God. But God. Who is rich. Rich in mercy. Thank goodness he's rich in mercy. Because I've used a bunch of it. He is rich in mercy. He has more mercy than anything else in the whole world. Every one of us in here needs mercy. Guess what? He's got it for you. And he's got enough. He never runs out. It's like the, the, the river of, of life just flowing through him. He has all we will ever need. We don't abuse it. But he always has mercy. He's rich in mercy because of his great love. For, because of his great love with which he loved us. Not us loving him, but him loving us. Even when we were dead in our transgressions, <clears throat> our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ by the grace, by his love, you have been saved. Only by his love have we been saved. It's not because we're good, not because we're perfect, not because we're just fine, fine Christians. It's because of his love for us that we get saved. And raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places with Christ Jesus. Man, I got a chair waiting up there next to the Lord. I'm going to be proud to sit there. I'm going to feel a little humbled, I'm afraid, and a little uh, ashamed of my past, but I get to sit with Jesus. I'm also going to work for Jesus until I get to sit with Jesus. When my work is over here, I get to go sit with Jesus. Now, I got a few things I want to ask him. Why did you let me do what I wanted to do when I wanted to do it? And I knew I shouldn't do it. And I did it anyway. And you just continue to let me do it. That's in Romans 7. We're going to see that, I think, next week. I love that scripture. And it goes on and on and on. But I'm going to be sitting there saying, if I'd have just done right in the beginning... How much more could I have done? You see, that's the guilt I'm going to feel. Now, I know it says there's no more tears, no more pain, et cetera, et cetera, and there's not. But I'm gonna, I know I'm going to feel guilty for what I should have done and didn't do. All those wasted years, which made me who I am today. I get that. I realize that. But what if I'd have changed 40 years ago like I should have? How much more could I have done? Now, God's not going to hold that against me because my book is going to be clean. All it's going to say in my book is that Woody, child of the Most High God, brother of Jesus. Yeah. But in my mind, I can think there must have been one, two, three, a thousand, ten thousand lives I could have touched. I can't go back and change that. 
So I don't look back and see how far I have and how bad I've messed up. I look back to see, though, how far I have come. And today I can do something about it, and tomorrow I can do something about it. Can't do anything about the past, but I can do something today, and I can do something tomorrow, and I can do something the next day. And I can continue on until I'm seated at the right hand of the Lord. Amen? So I will do what I do as best as I can do under his direction for he is the Lord of my life not me that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus for by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourself it is a gift of God it is a gift given to you from God. It is not something that you earn. It's not something that you buy. It's not something that you work for. It's not something that you spend all your money to try to accomplish. It's not something that you, that you act every day in, in order for him to be more and more pleased with you. It is a free gift that he gives you one time and it lasts forever. And you simply say, Jesus, be the Lord of my life. And in the book of John, Jesus says... I will come and live in you and I will never leave you, never forsake you. And he actually says, I and the Father will come and live in you. We will make our dwelling place in you. Wow. How can I disrespect the house of the Lord? See, when we speak of the house of the Lord, we talk about, oh, we have such a beautiful church. We do this. It's, it looks so good. I had people come in here the other day. Oh, the church looks really cool and blah, 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 blah. You know what I want them to say? I want to say, Woody, Woody, I'm looking at you, son. The church looks good. I want to look at Bubba and I'll say, Bubba, the church looks good. And I ain't talking about a building. I'm talking about Bubba. I want to look at big... I, Kathy, I don't know why I always want to call you Vicky. I want to look at Kathy, and I have, and I do, and I want to say, Kathy, the church looks good. I want to look at Chris and say, brother, the church looks good. See, you're the church. You're the church. I'm the church. And I want the church, the house of God, to look good. Not by works, lest anyone should boast. I have no room to speak about anything I've ever done. Other than to show you or explain to you or try to reveal to you how far God has taken me. And it is nothing that I've done on my own. I take no credit whatsoever. Matter of fact, I should be dead. Over and over and over again. But God, but God. For we are his workmanship created. We are created beings. God created us. Oh, yeah, I know. My mom and dad got together and they created me. No, no, God had a hand in it. God put your mom and dad together at that specific time for whatever reason. And you were created. A baby in the womb is not a thing. It is a created being. And God created it, though man does his best to kill it from time to time. I'm so thankful I see some movement in our country to reverse all that. Because God created you at that specific time for that specific purpose that he has foretold and fore, foreprogrammed or, or, or pro, pre-laid out, if you will, of what he wants for your life. Yes, you can deviate from it. Yes, you can wander astray on and on and on and on. But if God wants you, he's going to get you, and you ain't got a choice in it, so you might as well surrender now and just let him work. Amen. You won't win. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God pre prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God has a plan for your life. You're not worthless. You're not useless. You're not here for no reason. 
You're not just here for you. You're not here for your wife or your husband. You're here for God. You're here for God. So are we going to continue living for us? Or are we going to start living for God? Before the world began, God had a plan for you and I. That we are here at this appointed time for his good purpose and pleasure. For his good purpose and pleasure. We have, it seems, a church wanting, needing, whining children that need to grow up and realize God is for us and not against us. Oh, well, God don't love me no more because he did this and he did that. Wrong. That's Satan's job, and Satan's very good at it, and he's been doing it a long, long time. He's a punk, and you need to make him go away. How do you do that? In Jesus' name. And he must flee according to the word, and the word is true. And if we will become and come to him as a church of thanksgiving and giving praise, honor, and glory, instead of coming to him as whiny little children, he will supply all of our needs according to the riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Philippians 4.19, the true words of God. He will supply all that we need. Not all we want, but all we need. So this Thursday, please, please, please try to remember and look around and see all that God has given you. All that he's done for you and all that he will do for you. For those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Be thankful for all you have, but be ever so much more thankful for what you will, will receive, which is eternal life in the presence of God. I get to sit by Jesus. And when Bubba gets there, he'll push me over and he can sit next to Jesus. And that's fine. But I get to sit with Jesus, work for Jesus, because I'm a worker. That's, that's what I'm here to do. I'm here to work. And I'm here to work for Jesus, and I'll continue to work for him for all eternity. He's going to give me a, a better back, better knees, better shoulders, all the other stuff that's worn out. He's going to put it all back together, and it's all going to be in great shape. And then I'm going to do nothing but serve him. That is what I want to do. And what I want to do now is serve him. And that's what I try to do. Don't do it perfectly, but I do as best I can. Chris did an awesome job the last two Sundays with his message. Discipling and discipleship. We're not called to be Christians. We're not called to make Christians. He explained all this. We're called to make disciples. We're called to make disciples. How do we make disciples? We teach what we know. Make sure that it's right. Make sure it's the word. Don't come up with something on your own. Oh, well, the sky is really green. It's not blue because of this, that, and the other. Teach what you know from what God has taught you. And use that for somebody else. Each week, Pretty much each week. I talked to Chris about things to do. And this, that, and the other. He did his first funeral. Did a fantastic job. Fantastic job. And even as we sat up here. There were some things that I said. You know, do this, do this, do this. You know, so on and so forth. Because that's what I'm called to do. Now it's going to be his turn soon. To possibly take one of you. By the hand and say, hey. It's your turn. It's your turn to start learning. Vicky, Kathy, whatever you want to call her, okay? I have seen over the years an amazing turnaround from somebody who just used to come and sit and go home to somebody who is teaching others, discipling others. Not by saying you got to do this, you got to do this, you got to do this. You got to take one, two, three, four, and you got to learn all this stuff. And you got to do all this stuff, and you better know all the scriptures. And all, no, not, that's not what she does. 
she just shares with them what God has done with her and so therefore instructs what God can do for them. How hard is that? Do we do it? Most of the time we don't. Why? Because the world might think we're one of them Christian people. They might say, oh, you're one of them? Oh my gosh. Do you really believe all that bunk? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. And I don't know a, a, a millionth of what I need to know. But I know that God loves me. He loves me. I don't understand why, but I know he does. And I accept it. And therefore, I love him. And I want to please him. I want him to be happy. I want to hear when I get there, well done, good and faithful servant. Okay? Won't be perfect, but that's not what he's going to judge me on. He's going to judge me on what I've tried to do. My efforts. What are you trying to do? Well, first and foremost, if you don't know what to do, start giving him praise and thanks and glorifying him. Start saying, hey, thank you, God, for the life I have. Thank you, Lord, for the shoes on my feet. Thank you, Lord, for the pants on my waist. Thank you, Lord, for the shirt on my back. Thank you, Lord, for the church. Thank you, Lord, for my friends that come to church with me. Thank you, Lord, for the green grass. Thank you, Lord, for the, no, not cold weather. I hate cold weather. Thank you, Lord, for the warm days that are coming, okay? On and on and on. Give him thanks, give him praise, give him thanks, give him praise, give him thanks, give him praise. Don't come to him with the wants. Philippians 4.19 says he'll supply all your needs according to the riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Why are you telling him what you want? Yes, I know over in 1 Corinthians it says with prayer and petition. I think it's 1 Corinthians with prayer and petition. Uh, make your, your desires known to the Lord. I understand that, okay? But that's on your private time, okay? That's just in your closet. You talk to God. You tell him. You cry to him. You hurt. You, you be in agony. You be in pain. You be in whatever. He knows how you feel. And he wants you to express to him how you feel. But whenever you're out and about, you man, you need to give him praise. And even when you're in your closet, you need to start off with praise. Thank you, God, I can come in my closet and meet with you. Give him praise. That's how you please God. Oh, but I do all this stuff for him. That doesn't please God. You do that because of what he's done for you. You give him praise because what he has done. And you thank him for who he is. Maybe you don't know who he is. Well, I guarantee you, you keep coming to this church, you'll know who he is. Okay? Because that's what we do. We try to share God. I know how bad you are. You ain't near as close as I am or as bad as I am, but I know how bad you are. All right? I know some of your stories that would make a, ooh, make nuns run through the hills, okay? But what we want to do is, is, is we don't want to know your story. I want you to know how good God is in spite of you, in spite of me. Because he saved me for eternity. And he'll do the same for you. But you've got to call him to him. You have to come to him. You have to take that step. Say, dear Jesus, come into my life. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. And I shall follow you that from this day forward. How hard is that? Very difficult for some people. Because it's not an outward expression. This is not something that you do so everybody can see. This is something you do in your heart. This is something that you do in your very soul, in your spirit. You surrender to the Lord. You can do it verbally, but God knows your heart. So if you have not received Jesus as Lord and Savior, I recommend for your sake, not for mine, not for the church, not for God. God's already saved. Did anybody know that? God's already saved, okay? He, he's taken care of, all right? You're not doing him any favors, but you'd be doing yourself an injustice if you do not become a child of God. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, if there's anyone here today who does not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, Father, I ask you to open up their heart, souls, and spirit to receive you today. If that is you, and this is your time, don't put it off because you're not guaranteed tomorrow. You're not guaranteed another day. You're not guaranteed another minute, another hour. But if that's you today, and you have not received Jesus as Lord, become that new creation Paul tells us about, and receive Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life. It's very easy to do, but you must mean it in your heart. Just repeat after me. Dear Jesus, dear Jesus, dear beloved Jesus, thank you. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for caring about me. Thank you for being with me. Thank you for even acknowledging that I exist. Thank you for, for, for providing a way that I may spend eternity with you. I call on your name, Jesus. I ask you to come into my life, be my Lord and my Savior. From this moment forward, I desire and want so much to be a child of the Most High God. And I shall follow you as best I can every moment of my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.